Our next session is going to be from, from David Shookman. And what's Shookman? Shookman. <laughs> I should have checked that beforehand. <laughs> and he is a master of, of communicating uh, scientific and particularly environmental topics um, to large audiences. And so we're, we're very uh, grateful to have him here. And also, his session fits perfectly, picking up now that we know how to tell our stories uh, and how to structure them. Now we're talking about how, how to communicate them and think about the audiences and, and think about society more generally and how, how we communicate environmental topics in particular. So um, I'd like to hand over to David and, and thank you very much. Thank you very much, thank you very much. God, I'm uh, very, very pleased I came in time to hear those, uh, those stories. Uh, well done to, to all of you who've uh, who made the effort to do that. It's not easy, is it? I mean, you've had a day of facts and figures and exercises and stuff, and then to come up with, with really personal stories is, is remarkable. So my name's David Shookman. Uh, for many, many years, I was a BBC News reporter. And for the last 20 years, I reported on climate change. And the BBC allowed me to go all over the world to report on different aspects of climate change. So I've seen the ice melting in the Arctic, when deniers say, oh, it's not really melting up there. I've seen it, it is melting. I've been to the Amazon rainforest, when people say, well, we've got lots of forest, there's plenty of forest, what's the fuss about? Believe me, that forest is being hacked down at a staggering rate. I've seen other changes, like the permafrost, the frozen soils of Siberia, thawing and releasing methane, potent greenhouse gas. Again, you hear deniers say, well, that's always happened, hasn't it? We, we know from brilliant science that the amount of methane entering the atmosphere is growing all the time. So these are real changes. But what sticks with me isn't so much the facts, it's the stories. And once I was in Bangladesh on the coast. And I know you've all studied and you're all familiar with the problem of sea level rise. If you're in a low-lying country like Bangladesh, every millimeter of sea level rise makes a difference. And we were in this village on the coast that had just been really badly flooded. So seawater had come in through the sea defenses, these mud walls, into the fields, introducing salt water to the fields, not brilliant if you want to grow crops, flooded the houses, damaged the roads, and the villagers, a thousand of them, were seeking shelter on a remaining piece of the sea wall, this mud embankment about this wide. It was the world's narrowest refugee camp. And we were there filming, and I got talking to people, and there was one woman with two sons. She was a widow, and we got talking, and I said, can I ask you about your situation? And she said, yes. And she explained how difficult it was. You know what, they were surrounded by water, but the wrong sort of water. She said how difficult it was to get fresh water. Every day, a few boats went off, to the nearest source of fresh water inland, and she would try to get some. You know how heavy water is? One liter weighs a kilo. And how much water you need to cook, to drink, to wash. And this woman, Shorbanu, had a 15 liter container. So that weighed 15 kilos when it was full. And every few days she would go off, if there was a boat going, with this container, leaving her kids to get the fresh water, lug it back, and the boat didn't get her all the way back. She had to carry this 15 kilo container down a muddy embankment to her shelter. And I was stunned hearing this, and because uh, I had a water bottle, like in my backpack, you know, I'd flown in and I had my water bottle, and so I felt a bit guilty about that offered to share it. She refused. But do you know what really hit me? While we were talking, uh, I realized that she was asking my interpreter a question. And 
I said to myself, well, sort of what, what's kind of going on? And the interpreter said, Shobanu here is offering to make you and your crew a cup of tea. And I just thought, wait a minute, there's no way I'm going to allow you. I mean, I'm honored beyond words, but there's no way I'm going to let you use your precious water for me because I can drive off any time I want and get fresh water. We were in the nearest town five hours later where there was fresh water. And it struck me that in all the ways we, we try to talk about climate change and how there's injustice and how the global north caused it and the global south suffers and, and how the money that's been promised hasn't been delivered, and all of that, at the heart of it, there's a story about human dignity. It's about everybody has the right to dignity. And I will treasure forever Shorbanu offering me, a visitor, a cup of water that she had lugged down a muddy embankment at great personal cost to herself. And so I think how easy it is when we're talking about climate change. I don't know whether any of you have been to a COP or you're going to a COP28 or there's a bit of a nodding head there. It's very easy at those events to forget this is a human story. This is a human story. This is about people's lives. We'll get caught up in the numbers at COP28. There'll be a whole load of rows about the 100 billion and all the rest of it, but ultimately it comes down to a human story and whether we all, particularly in the global north, are doing everything we possibly can to allow our fellow humans to live in dignity. And I think if one holds that in mind, for me that's a kind of guiding, a guiding principle. Something that's, I hope, going to be useful to you, because I was very impressed by the stories that I heard earlier. As a journalist, I interview people all the time. So, Shorbanu in the Bangladeshi village. And I'm wondering whether anybody amongst you would like to go through, in this safe space, a pretend interview. You're with a journalist. I'm at your disposal. We've got a little bit of time. If there's anybody, I don't know what jobs you will do or what walks of life you're in, what your passions are. I've heard a couple of the stories. If anybody would like the experience of talking about your climate story, some aspect of climate change, what it means for your community, where you work, how you deal with climate deniers. I could pretend to be a climate denier, if you like. If there's anyone who'd like the experience of a two, three minute like mock interview, we could try and do it. Do I need a hand in the air? I'm getting a few hands in the air. Was your hand forced in the air? Oh, no, no, no. Uh, I think there was a bit of volunteering going on. I, think you I were promise I wouldn't do that to her. She's yeah? just had her hand up for a while. Look, we're getting um, chairs and everything. Do you want to come up? Yes, Let's go. come on up. Let's go. Come on up. Woo! Round of applause. <laughs> Round of applause. One of the wonderful organizers will wave at me or throw things as to when we've got to finish this session. But let's see how many we can do. Well, the chair makes it so much scarier. It does, doesn't it, actually? Well, we, did, well, we can stand. Would you I prefer to? No, I'm happy. The chair's fine. It's just seeing the chair. I, I like now to the chair's here. Now the chair's here. OK. <laughs> Tell you what, look, you get a glass of water and everything. Look at that. OK. Look at that. Look at that. Um, tell me, what's your name? Lucy. Lucy. And what do you do? Uh, I am the Accessibility and Diversity Officer for the Young Liberals, so the, the youth wing of the Liberal Democrats. And just give me your climate angle. Um, so I, well, specifically, I'm, I'm disabled, um, and one of the kind of my main um, kind of passions in terms of climate change is the effect that it has on disabled people, both uh, in this country, um, obviously we've had a, a heat wave recently and a lot of people who've been really struggling with that, but also kind of in a more global context, specifically, you know, refugees more widely, but climate refugees, the people who are most likely to struggle with kind of being displaced and having to try and find somewhere to relocate to and somewhere to take refuge are people who are disabled and less likely to kind of, are more likely to need assistance from other people. How about this for an idea? Um, we just pretend to do a little interview, all right? Okay. 
And, and the introduction will be something like, we could do it, let's say we're on radio or TV. Actually, we've got I this did, lovely... I did study radio production. Did you? I okay. did. <laughs> let's pretend it's TV because we've got this amazing backdrop, this amazing room. We've got the glasses of water on the table. It's like a real <laughs> TV studio. So the introduction would be, I'm just making this up, right, as we go along. But, you know, so there's a new report out today from the UN about climate change, uh, devastating implications for billions of people around the world. But one group that isn't often thought about in the context of a climate impact are disabled people. And I'm delighted to say that with me, live, is Lucy. Lucy, tell us what climate change means to the disabled community in particular. I think one of the things that isn't often thought about is um, the impact that climate change has on health um, more widely, and disabled people are the most likely to rely on um, on having regular contact with uh, with health professionals and being able to um, and being able to kind of keep a track of, of of their health generally. And I think one of the things going forward um, with you know having fire, wildfires and floods and things that have a devastating impact on people's health. Um, the people who are less likely to be to be able to um, to relocate are are people who rely on other people to um, to support them. So finding it harder to move if they have to, but also maybe just getting around to a medical appointment, for example, if the trains are closed in a heat strike, a uh, heat uh, wave, for example. I that think kind of thing. not even if just accessibility. Not even just if trains are closed. I think a lot of. Uh, we kind of consider London transport to be more accessible than a lot of the country, but actually is still m many stations either don't have lifts or have lifts that are often broken or, um, or kind of not uh, kept in good, in good condition. But just help me with this, because I think a lot of people might have this question in mind. What is it particularly about disabled people? I mean, everyone, I think, accepts that climate change having a, a devastating set of impacts on many, many people. People trying to work out of doors in heat waves, for example. Um, that's just one example. What, what is in particular about disabled people that makes them more vulnerable than anybody else? Uh, so, for example, disabled people are more likely to rely on medical equipment, which um, obviously needs a source of energy. So if, you have, um, if you're having problems with um, access to energy sources... Um, so like power cuts, for example. Power cuts, okay. for example. Yeah. Um, being able to make sure that that yeah. medical equipment is kept running. Right. Um, or disabled people who, um, like myself, I have... Uh, it's quite fairly severe heat intolerance, so over a certain temperature, I'm just not really able to function. Um, so being able to have access to, I, I have the luxury of having access to, for example, an air conditioning unit to right. keep things cool. Um, but obviously not everyone has that privilege. Um, Particularly in the global south. Especially in the global south. Who can afford that? Right, okay. I think also we, we also kind of uh, dismiss the fact that it, when things get difficult, we tend to kind of take a, an every man for himself approach. And I think particularly as we've seen recently with the uh, COVID pandemic, um, despite the fact that the disabled community were the group that were most affected, they were also the group that were most left behind. So I think we need to make sure that going forward with climate change, that we have a kind of a plan to make sure that disabled people are, are protected and not left behind in the Thank same you. way. We've got to leave it there. We're running out of time. It's the weather next. Thank you very much Thank indeed. <laughs> Great. Uh, well done, well done. Any other volunteers? Come on up. Hey. Run on the Got that. Um, Lucy, you were superb. And um, in these situations, I think it's quite nice to offer the interviewee, it's a safe space, the level of where they want to be on the thermostat of the interview. Right? Uh, there's utterly easy, cool, let's relax, it's all right, chill. So I'm going to be grilled now or what? Or do you want to whack that thermostat up to global warming max? Okay, what's your name? Julius. Julius. And where do you work? What do you do? I just finished university. Okay. Politics and, and law. Um, and I'd like to work in, in um, business consulting to make businesses greener. Okay. Um, and I am a little bit faced with this challenge of greenwashing. Okay. Um, yeah. And I'd like to navigate that field a bit better. Right. And I recently had a job interview with the uh, Federation of, of, of Industries of my home country, Austria, which claims 
that you know, climate action is important anyway. Right. But they're greenwashing, are they? But that's what I'm trying to establish. Okay. okay. I'm try I don't okay. know if, if industry me, can be Let green. me ask you, do you encounter climate denial in these conversations? Do you have like an uncle who says, yeah, but I read on Facebook, you know, that volcanoes produce more carbon dioxide than human activity. Do you have that kind of thing? Very ashamedly, yeah. the Austrian chancellor recently said that. I think I yeah. saw something about that. How about we just try, because I know, I, I'm guessing, I, I get it, and I'm, I'm sure you all do, the denier interaction, right? I mean, it still happens. There, there are plenty of deniers out there. And I think it, it may be, I'm going to suggest it may be helpful in the context you're going into in the business world. Um, and since you had your IPCC analysis earlier with climate fresco and everything, should we give it a go? Uh, I'll, I'll, we can, let's see how it goes. Who am I? You're Julius. You're a, <laughs> you're a business consultant specializing in helping companies be genuinely green. Right? That's what you want to do. Yes, that's right. Okay. So let's just put, let's just fast forward three years and you're in a good role and you're doing brilliantly, right? And you end up on Austrian TV with a bit of a climate denier presenter. They exist. We all know that, right? You're on the equivalent of GB News in Austria, right? It's all bollocks, this climate thing, all right? Okay. Three, two, one. We're live. We've finished the ad break. I want to welcome Julius to the studio. He's a business consultant, and he's told us that his job, it says here in my notes, that he specializes in helping companies go green. What on earth does that mean? That means utilizing science and uh, technological innovation uh, to drive forward um, the world that we want to live in, in terms of um, keeping emissions down, keeping global warming down or bringing it down, um, and in terms of having also a, a better life. So why should we bother? The Chinese are building two coal-fired power stations every week. And you want us to live in the cold and dark and be poorer. I'd like us to live in, in green warmth um, and be richer. What, green but cold? Green but cold? No. You want us to be cooler? Green and warm in the sense that um, there is a lot of alternatives to, to energy, to the usual suspects. Nothing better than a good old coal-fired power station. We know how they work. They've made the world wealthy. Look what they've done for global prosperity. You Greens want to take us away from all of that. The problem is that um, we all want heat, but we all, we all want it in moderation, right? And if we keep the coal, fire, coal power station going, um, the heat will get a bit out of hand. You mentioned the science. Now, I mean, we all know these scientists are in it for themselves, aren't they? If they just put the word climate into their grant applications, they get more money. It's all a hoax, isn't it? Well, the, what they put forward in their applications or the fact that there is money for climate uh, projects? Well, they just say these climate, they're all government funded, they're taxpayer funded, these scientists, right? So they just make it up as they go along. Then they go off on a jolly to the Arctic, measure the glaciers, right? We all know it's nonsense, don't we? Um, do you have proof? Well, you're the one saying there's proof. They're off on a jolly. They okay. make it all up. Well, let, let, me, let me approach it this way. There is always The so-called IPCC said all the glaciers were melting. Um, well, it's not just the IPCC, because the, I mean, the IPCC on its own is, 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 is thousands of scientists from around the world which are then funded by governments of very different parties and very different uh, political ideologies also, including uh, very um, much, um, you know, a spectrum that you maybe wouldn't associate with being green, such as, I don't know, uh, the Donald Trump administration and others. However, overall, 99% of scientists claim that climate change is real. So the question is, why believe the 1% as opposed to the 99%? Julius, that's all we've got time for. We'll let you get back to your greens. Thank you. Um, and we'll have the 1% on next week. Thank you. Well done. Well done. Well done. Very, very good. Very, very good. That was pretty high on the thermostat, wasn't it?
Any other volunteers? I don't know what we've got time for. Yeah, yeah, come on. I, I see you've been loving it. You've been enjoying it, haven't you? Yeah. I saw you were grinning. Yes, I was. Yeah? Um, yeah, good. Wow, it's getting We've got really a bit of music. Oh, it's amazing. All right, be before the music runs, I need to know your name. Um, so my name's Doyen. Doyen? Yep. With a D? Yeah. Okay. Um, what do you do? Um, so I'm currently a GP trainee. In You're a GP West trainee? Yeah. Heard on the news this morning the government wants to shorten the GP training process. Anyway, that's just a little thing. Oh. Yeah. I so, hope they don't. Yeah, 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 exactly. I wondered how <laughs> safe dodging. that would be. So what's the angle with climate then for you? So the angle with climate for me is the fact that health and climate and our environment are just so interlinked and I feel that at uni and just going through training it's not something that's very highlighted. Right. Um, the medical important. establishment isn't swift to change is it? No, no yeah. it is not For a long time, yeah. So do we talk about the, the, well where do you want to be on the thermostat then? Not, not as hot. Not the Julius, okay. <laughs> let's, let's do this differently, let's do this differently. So let's, now for the first time mm. at a COP COP28 is going to have a day devoted to health, which is long overdue. Yeah, I mean, some of us have been quietly lobbying for that for a while, and it's now happening, which is fantastic. So let's just picture you in Dubai, COP28 in December, why not? And uh, we're doing a session or broadcast or something about why there should be a health day, why it matters, what the key points are. How about that? Okay. Sounds good. Can we run that uh, theme tune again to get us in the mood? Look, there's a guy running. Look at that. I like that. It's like the build-up to the 6 o'clock news. There's always someone running, you know, because, you know, it takes me back to my BBC days. Here we go. Whoa! Okay. We're not live yet, but we will be very soon. All right. Okay. Welcome back to BBC News. And I'm delighted that Doyen is with us, a junior trainee, GP, and here we are for our live broadcast from COP28 on Health Day, the first Health Day ever at, uh, in the 28 years of these climate COPs. Doyne, wh why do you think it matters so much for health to be recognized in the context of you know, this massive international climate negotiation? So I just really, really need people to understand the intersectionality that we have between health and the environment. When we look at things like vector-borne diseases, when we looked at uh, air pollution and the impact that that's having on kids with asthma, as we heard earlier about Ella, an eight-year-old who passed away due to air pollution and her asthma. Like, it's just something that we need to address. And we also need to address the impacts of health on the environment as well. So as we've had like the CFC inhalers that have phased out of use due to their impacts on the environment. So I, I was talking, this is a true story, to a senior person at the WHO who was battling for years to get the medical establishment to engage with climate. What, what is it about the reticence to do that, do you think? I mean, obviously it's, you know, people work in silos, the climate crowd do climate and then the medics do medicine, but wh why, why do you think the, the health care professionals have been slow to see the relevance of climate change? There are probably a million reasons for it. I think one of the big things is that we've always been taught a certain way from med school, the people that are our leaders think in a certain way, and we've just been put on this treadmill of just health and the individual's responsibility of their health, and we don't really see, as you said, like operating in silos. And I think nowadays people are starting to recognize how planetary health and um, just human health and the environment is all linked. But I think for too long, people have operated in silos. They've been allowed to operate in silos and they've not had anyone really shaking things up and making them have to like stop and think, are we really doing things the right way or do we need to try and change how we're thinking? So. Imagine you're with Okay, you've got a global audience here of millions, all right, who are appreciating your broadcast. But just imagine you could sit down now with two or three of the, I don't know, the head of the Royal College of Surgeons, the head of the 
British Medical Association, whatever, the top people in the British health establishment, give us one line that you think would convince them to take climate more seriously. What, what's the burning issue, do you think? For me personally, the burning issue is the impact of climate change on people that are vulnerable, as Lucy said before. It's just not okay for us to leave them behind and we need to do more for them and we need to understand the way that the climate is impacting them in order to make a change because we need to be able to provide them with the information that they need so that they can maintain their health whilst all of this is going on and we need to find ways to reduce it so that they don't have to suffer as much. Doyen, very powerful and I'm very glad we invited you here to COP28. Thank you Thank very you much. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Hey, you were, you were brilliant. Uh, weren't you sensational? Um, now, look, have, have I run out of time? I mean, can I just say uh, well done to, to the three of you who volunteered for that process? I hope you're okay. Is there a drink afterwards or something? Anyway, um, well done. I mean, I, I think it's, I hope, a helpful process for those who went through it uh, and those who witnessed it because really what we're talking about is how do you find the language that connects with the people you engage with? Whether it's a broadcast audience of millions, or it's a talk in a school, or it's a conversation with the boss of a company, or your boss, or your family, or the tricky uncle who's on Facebook a bit too much and reads a lot on climate denier nonsense, right? Whoever it is, individual, small group, big group, global group, whatever, finding the language that connects with them, and which is why I think everything that, that I've heard you do earlier today about storytelling is so key, because that's what's going to cut through. And uh, the three of you, I thought, all did superbly. Um, so I think if I just leave you with one thought, it is that we saw, I don't know if you saw the news, King Charles launched the climate clock uh, a couple of days ago. I mean, we all know, don't we, that things are really, really urgent, right? It seems to me that every day counts, which means that every conversation counts, which means that every opportunity, wherever you work, wherever you hang out, whoever you're with, every moment is an opportunity potentially a responsibility now that you're equipped with the knowledge and you've got the passion, obviously, to try to shift opinions, shift behavior, because there is just time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hey.